Welcome into another episode of Everything is Logistics. I am your host, Blythe Burnley, and this podcast is for the thinkers in freight. And we have a really, really good guest for you today, the podcast sponsor at Maersk, and that is Arez. Say your last name for me. Agamoni. Agamoni. And you are the Senior Vice President of Innovation and Strategic Growth in North America. So Arez, That's welcome right. to the show. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Now, you, I wanted to read off a couple stats because by the numbers, Maersk is the world's largest shipping container company with a 2020, 2021 number of 700 ships in their fleet. Nearly one out of every five containers shipped by sea are handled by Maersk. And every six minutes, at least one port around the world can be called upon by a Maersk ship. Do you pinch yourself at times that you get to work for a company like that? Uh, yes, like <laughs> yes and no. You know, because size, it's not the important part here. Size does matter in many things in life, but not... I think here we care more about how can we give value to our customers on an end-to-end -end journey rather than just on the ocean portion. So I'm pinching myself to, wow, a great... For a company that's willing to change something that was for almost above 100 years done in a certain way and now said you know what that's not what we hear the customers are interested let's change it all over again so that's what i'm excited about actually and so you have a really lengthy career in different countries all over the globe in logistics and supply chain so how that's did right. you find yourself working for maris interesting uh Wait, I, so I, I'm, I'm born in Israel, mm -hmm. I'm raised in Israel, uh, did my learning and my military service like everybody else. And, and after that, when I was 25, 21 years old, I basically decided to go for a trip and maybe stay a little bit in Japan, spend a year there. And then I like, okay, I'll travel a bit in Asia and I decided to stay in Thailand. So I took my bachelor degree, master degree, and PhD all in Thailand, but at the same time, I also worked. So mm -hmm. I started to work for um, El Al, Israeli airline, and I worked in the passenger, but then I realized, you know what, I'd rather d work with the boxes. It's, it's more interesting, challenging than uh, the passenger side. So I moved to the cargo. Through that, I moved to other freight forwarders, an IT company in the middle, and then I was basically approached by Maersk to run all the air freight for Asia Pacific and manage it for that. That's kind of how I joined the company about 13 years ago. And so with being the, the senior vice president of innovation and strategic growth, what involves in the day-to-day -day of innovation with a, a, a company you said is more than 100 years old? Yes, more than 100 years old, more than 100,000 people. Uh, innovation, for us is something that we would like in a drastic way to change the way we operate for the benefit of the customers, but also for the benefit of our own operations to improve things, to change things. We do have the continuous improvement teams that are doing the small needed changes to make things much better. But here in the Innovation Center, we thought to ourselves, how can we actually change in a big way, in a fast way, radically the, the way we're working. So that's kind of a lot of, of the things that we're concentrating. Myself, I'm also responsible for engineering. Uh, so I have the innovation center, I have the engineer, I have the maintenance uh, teams. So everything that's done with innovation and we prove it goes now to the engineering team that they can design it as part of our new uh, product offering of new solutions. So it's not stuck anymore just in isolated innovation center and, oh, sorry, please use us, please use us, but nobody want to do anything, <laughs> which, which was the case at the beginning. We, we kind of develop things, we improve things, and then like, ah, no, we do things in a different way, even internally. So we kind of having that flow of testing, proving a concept, moving into production and actually using it as part of our day-to-day uh, -day operation. So, so what does your, your role look like? When you wake up on a Monday morning, what are you tackling first thing? Uh, first thing, all the emails from the weekend, because this business never right. stops, right? It's 24-7, so the night before I cleared, but now next. Uh, but we're trying to tackle multiple elements. Uh, under the Innovation Center, we're trying to look for research and development, so all the proof of concept about robotics, 
and about uh, machine learnings and about different type of elements that we actually we can create proof of concept. On the digital transformation, we have four elements. Then the second one is digital transformation, where we're trying to take all our systems, create kind of something in a different level. One of the key projects we're working on right now is a digital twin for warehouses. So we're trying to, how can we simulate the way we work inside the warehouse? How can we improve that? The third part of the innovation center is data innovation. So we're using all the data. We have millions of lines of data almost on a daily imagine basis. Imagine how much data you're working with. <laughs> massive, massive amount of data. But it's still in silo systems mm -hmm. that it's very locked and difficult for us. So we are now pulling that and trying to give it access to all the people that needs and also for the innovation center itself so they can start build certain elements of that. The last but not least is a product innovation where we create new product, new solution for our customers based on problems they like to solve. So that's kind of things that we are struggling or, or trying to solve on a regular basis. We, okay, what problems we have, what solution are there, how can we bridge the gap between the problem and, and different solutions. So on, on the innovation side, it sounds like you're really trying to optimize a company that has probably you know, been used to what they've been doing for a very long time in a certain way that they do it, and you're trying to change and optimize you know, in order to obviously get more revenue. That's what any business is trying yes. to do. But for if we could back it up just a minute, for the casual logistics fan, yeah. how do you go about booking... A car, booking a cargo ship or booking a container. Booking a container with MERS. Yeah, how do you, how, okay. what does that process look like? You make a phone call. No. <laughs> Is it really that simple, just making a phone call? No, there's no phone calls anymore. You don't That's do that. That's all emails on That's, Monday mornings. <laughs> That's not emails anymore, right? So if you, if you are small to medium-sized customers that doesn't want to have a long-term contract, you're basically going to a portal, you add all the information, or you can upload a, a file with all the information. You create a booking, you, get, you get an immediate confirmation or suggestion for other uh, trip that you can take. If you are a larger company and you are having certain contracts on a regular basis, there is an EDI connectivity or API connectivity mm. between your system and our system. And basically you, you click in your system, you want to book it with Maersk and automatically it moved to our system and back to get basically a confirm. The, the, the days of making a phone call is, is basically So over. it's almost like you're, you're buying something online and just yeah. choosing the it, shipping option. It is, yes it is. That's wild, yeah. but you know, that's pretty yeah. cool. But, so for- By the way, it's not only ocean, right? You can book air freight, you can book other elements of services. So it's really an end to end. Uh, integration and I, and I love and I you guys are getting into warehousing and robotics and things like that and I, I really want to hit on that and and later on in the conversation but um, first I wanted to, to touch on you mentioned earlier that you were born and raised in Israel yeah so what does the what does the and you spent some time in Thailand Japan you know Latin America as well what does the logistics scene look like in each of these are they more similar or do they have their own kind of mm -hmm. There are all nuances and things to fix, or maybe is it a combination of the two? You, you have a combination of the two. There is nuances in each country and each part of the world. You know, Asia is more of a shipping you know, region for cargo. Of course, it's some cargo moving internally within the region, but it's more of a, a, a region. The U.S. is more, North America is more of a destination. So you have nuances, mm -hmm. definitely. From that perspective, there's also nuances from the power of the buying power. A country like, I don't know what, Israel doesn't have the buying power of the U.S. Huh. It's a different level, different game that we're talking about. Latin America is, is coming from a different angle as well. But at the end of the day, when you talk to customers, when you see what's going on, more or less people have similar problems. So, yes, it's different. It's slightly here, slightly there. But people have the same problems. They have lack of visibility. They have uh, inconsistency of supply chain. It's very difficult for them to understand when cargo will arrive, uh, and, and et cetera, et cetera. There's multiple problems that basically you're like, wait, so if I solve it in one place, can I solve it in another place and, and making it in much faster growth on the solving? So same problems, just different 
languages being spoken to fix the yes. problem or try to address the problem. Yep. And so where do you think is the, I guess globally, where do you think the most opportunity for supply chain optimization exists? Is it Latin America or is it Asia or, or the U.S.? I, mean, uh, I would say the U.S. is definitely a place with a lot of opportunities just because of the massive amount of cargos that comes into the U.S. There's not there's much more inbound than outbound, of course. But so uh, this is a big place that you can solve. Of course, there is a lot of places that you need to go much to the basic to solve different problems. Like in Africa, in certain places in Latin America, you need to basically solve how do I reach safely with my cargo to a place and make sure that it's still there. Right. <laughs> you know? Or just construction, really. I, I was in Belize last year, and the sheer amount of road construction crews, exactly. it was dominant because yeah. they, they have one main road and then all of this all of this development is extending off of that one main road that was built, yeah. which is fascinating. Traffic, traffic jams and, and issues and problem around. It was there. road construction the entire way. And I thought that was fascinating. I said, like, wow, there's gotta be so much opportunity for trucking here yeah. in the near future. Oh, yeah. oh, so yeah. it just made me think of, you know, what other opportunities or whether, what other areas of the world do those opportunities exist and yeah. where are they, you know, the, the, the sweet spots of, of maybe innovation that could come from that. Now, now from the, the business side of things, you know, shipping obviously went mainstream in, in 2020. We had the shopping habits during COVID. We had the Ever Given that sort of, you know, made supply chain famous. Um, we had lockdowns in China, container shortages. But for the average consumer, how much do all of these things happening at once happen? Is there always a bunch of, a combination of things affecting yeah. your shipments? Or was <clears throat> it just the past two years of craziness? That's a good question. And I, before I answer that, I like that you said COVID makes supply chain famous. That's absolutely true. Before that, people used to ask me, what do you do? And I'm like, supply chain. <laughs> what does it mean? It's like, I said, okay, I'm working for a shipping line. I'm like, so what? Are you riding a <laughs> vessel? Not really. So what? You're driving a truck? Not really. <laughs> it was very difficult to yes. explain that. But so I, I, I like that point. Really, finally, people realize what is supply chain and how much they're depending on supply chain. And then, they, oh, because of you, we don't get our cargo. I said, no, <laughs> that's not the case. But I think COVID period was uh, multiple things that happened at the same time. It's not really what we see on a regular basis. There are dramas and problems all the time. You know, before that you have issues with the ports, before that you can have, or, or during the same time, actually, we have the Suez Canal, a vessel stuck. You know, it's, it's ramp up on top of each other, so many things together. And on top of that, we have the bullwhip effect in supply chain, where people get panic and they start ordering too much, and then they get panic to the other side and let's stop everything, and that creates much more uh, problems in supply chain of the whole world. You know, if, if everybody stops moving, vessels will not keep moving around. They will, they will stop. And then if everybody turn it on back at the same time, you don't have the capacity to bring it back. You know, you, it takes time to bring the capacity. So those type of reaction of, of behaviors of people, it's, it's, it's an issue also that ramplify this, this problem that we saw. And I think it's also a, a really quick way to see what the pulse of the globe is going through. I was just reading the other day that there is a um, that the demand for cardboard box, for cardboard has dramatically decreased. Whereas yeah. you know, in the middle of all these e-commerce <coughs> shipments in the middle of COVID, you have an insane demand for cardboard because everything yes. you know gets from the port to the porch. It's getting shipped in a cardboard box, so you can kind of kinda see what the sentiment level is based on cardboard demand, which is yeah. crazy. I, I thought that was super fascinating. So from, from, I guess, from that perspective of cardboard you know, declining and demand sort of declining, how long does it take for a system like Maersk to adjust to that demand? Is it a slow chug or is it something that you almost can react to immediately because you have access to this data? So first of all, because we have that access to data and because we are managing supply chains for very large customers, we can see a little bit before the impact really happened. You see the drop of orders, you see the drop of uh, things that will happen. But 
Even then, you cannot just immediately say, you know what, I will shrink capacity, I will reduce that, because it can amplify other problems later on. So you want to be cautious when you do that. It will increase the price, which is not ideal for anybody, because then we, we live in up and down volatile business. So even that we see sometimes the information in advance and we know what's happening, we normally take much more uh, smaller steps to adjust just because of what it could Im Im impact in the bigger picture. So it's not like you're, you're shutting down all the ships and no. calling them all back. It's, it's something that no. you adjust it's, slowly, which yeah. makes a ton of sense. I think COVID was, when COVID started and everything shut down in very fast, that was one of the first time we really start to pull, they call it strings or moves of, of uh, vessels. We kind of pulled them out and said, you know what? Okay, let's cancel, cancel, cancel. Because there was no point to run an empty vessel back and forward. So. Real quick, where do you store? So in the peak of COVID, when everything is locked down and you're calling all your ships back, are, is there like one central port no, that you're no. keeping all of the ships? Or are they strategically placed throughout <laughs> the world? They're strategically placed and they might be utilized for doing something else uh, rather than just stand still. So uh, they're, they're not just, uh, there's no... Big so, parking lot. <laughs> <laughs> no big parking lot, which, I mean, brings me to my next question because there's kind of a, in the, in the height of COVID, you know, we had all these backlogs on the West Coast with, you know, there, there are certain ports within the United States um, that can only handle these bigger ships. So there's an argument now that, oh, well, you should make those smaller ships because then they can go to more ports. With everything kind of relatively opened back up, are you still, how are you planning the ship construction process? Do you factor in the last two years or do you factor in the historical we amount are. of time that your company has been? No, we, we definitely factor the, the last few years changes in terms of how is the market developed, how things mm -hmm. change. But even more than that, we are factoring how do we want to be doing things in terms of impact on the environment, right? So. We're trying to reduce CO2 emission. We, we definitely can deep dive into that as well, but it, it is, it's impacting the size of a ship. You can't have yet a zero emission uh, or, or neutral uh, emission ship that move 21,000 containers. Not yet, you can have it in 8,000 containers. Hmm. So, so you can actually- you can Diversify uh, your fleet you, a little. You, you have to diversify and you have to think about different market, different reasons to do things, uh, but size in that case does matter and at the end of the day it's also the case of what price matters to our customers are they willing to pay slightly more and get it faster into more different ports or do they need a, to be cheaper so you have to bulk it all in a big vessel so we definitely have both elements and we're going to keep uh, having both sizes and I, and I believe you, you guys are, you, you plan to launch the first carbon neutral ship by this year? And yes. that was seven years ahead of schedule of when that, you originally that planned That is absolutely it. correct. How, how are you guys, are, give us a little bit of a lay down or, or a rundown of, of what a carbon neutral ship looks like. Because for folks who don't know, shipping is, is pretty carbon efficient. It's one of them uh, compared to truckload, yep. of course. Um, but explain to how you make a, an efficient process even more efficient. So let's start, let's start at the beginning. We originally, we decided that we want to be by 2050, 100% zero net oh, wow. carbon footprint for the, for the whole company. And the bigger problem was for us, how can we tackle the ships, the vessels? Because this is something that you, you don't just buy every day a different vessel. The vessel lifetime, it's anywhere between 20, 25, 30 years. So if you want to be by 2050, you need by 2030 the latest to have something that is already working. So there was a lot of different works. There was a, a innovation thinking. They tried to do it with sales. Doesn't really work for the large vessels, of course. Uh, they thought about uh, container size batteries. It takes too much space, it's too heavy, it's too unreli not reliable. At the end of the day, what we found today is that the biofuels are basically the best way to, to approach it. Mm. So basically, you are using a fuel that to produce it, you're absorbing more CO2 than you are actually 
polluting back at the end of the day. So for example, a corn oil. You have to grow corn. When you grow corn, you absorb CO2. The amount of uh, oil that you can produce will, the same amount of corpse that you have will produce enough oil that we actually be able to be utilized for those things. Ammonia is another uh, mm. solutions that, uh, green ammonia, there is another solution that is coming. So there are multiple things that came up and when we started to see that, yes, it's coming up and we order our first vessels that is coming this year, we basically decided to reduce it in 20, instead of 2050, we are now putting our goal to 2040. Oh, wow. So we reduced, we shaved 10 years of that goal. And, and now it's going across multiple things, not only the vessels. And so with your, with your green initiatives, you also have the other aspect of all of these other lines of businesses that you guys are, are going into or, or have gone into. Yeah. So warehousing, robotics, trucking, is that in, yes. in the works for you? So it you asset-based truck? We are asset-based. Right? What, what does that look like? How, give us, a, I guess, a scope of you know the amount of warehouses you have. Is it globally or just in the United States? So it's globally. We have a few thousand warehouses globally. In the U.S. alone, we had, three years ago, we had about 20 warehouses. Now we have slightly more than 200. So in three years, that's a big, big jump. Similar jump around the world. We, we did it both uh, natural growth, but also acquisitions. So we bought in the last few years, few, few companies that help us because it takes a long time to build that capability. So instead of just try and error, let's get people that are expert and combine them with the expertise that we have in order to grow into that. So we have warehouses, trucks in the US, we have a few thousand trucks. We just recently, last year, we ordered 400 electric trucks to be deployed in the next two years. So we started to get some of those electric trucks. We already have some of them, and it's going to be growing even more in the amounts of trucks that we have. So, so it sounds like you're, you're not just innovating and going green with the ships. It sounds like you're, you're trying yes. to do that on the warehousing and the trucking side, too. Yes, 100%. Warehouses, we are trying to find ways to... How can we reduce the energy consumptions? We are looking into different uh, solutions right now. We are actually doing some uh, capstone projects with MIT to see how can we find for the warehouse itself a much better innovative way to reduce, not just by moving to uh, sourcing from a different uh, electric company, but also uh, power, solars, windmills, uh, batteries that can help to absorb from the grid some energy and utilize that power during peak time so you can flatten the curve. So it's instead of just creating peaks of, of usage, you are you're actually creating. So there are multiple ideas that we are looking at and, and definitely uh, believe that we will be there. And, and the goal of 2040 is across all business. It's not just for the vessel. So the warehouses and by 2030, we're going to be 90% uh, efficient, and by 2040, it's going to be 100%. So it's it's across every single business that we have. And it sounds like you're you're almost diversifying the uh, sustainability and environmental approach to all of the different diversifications of your business. Yes. How yes. much of a task is that? I, I imagine it's, it's a lot. It's a that's, lot. That's, that's it's why a you're lot here. And right? it's, it's a lot, and it's a big, a lot of teams, each focus on different elements in order to make it successful because it's a big task it's not easy to, to make it happen. Is, is there any I guess aspects of the diversification for environmental sustainability that is really interesting to you right now uh, the different alternative fuels is definitely <laughs> interesting we are considering to, to, to trial hydrogen right now uh, in certain cases where it's available uh, as I mentioned the battery thing it's something really beginning that mm. we are really early stages, can it help? We, we saw that even cities are now, like Manhattan is about to use something similar. So if a city can do that, why a warehouse can't, you know? Uh, let, let's try to, to bring those elements that otherwise does not exist today. And, and, and you just, energy you've been produced no matter what, the grid will keep producing the peak no matter if you use it or not. So we rather use it and absorb it and use, utilize later much lower than that so that we believe this is a good a good way forward absolutely because i think for a lot of folks they just think oh you can just capture it and just have endless supply and it's like no you have to have that yeah. storage solution of as course. well in order to make it truly efficient make, and truly green 
Now, on a little switching gears a little bit, you know, you said you're born and raised in Israel. You know, we're at Manifest, the future of logistics. There was a really great announcement that was made by the Port of Ashdod. I hope I said that right over yes. in Israel. Yeah. Uh, can you give us a little insight on on that that partnership with Mayors? Okay. So the innovation center is 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 not living in a bubble. We building an ecosystem around us. So it starts with different internal stakeholders, all the different products and operations that we have, all the different enablers, so our IT folks, our HR, legal. So we have to use all these internal stakeholders to be part of what we're doing. But then we have a very important external stakeholders that we're working with. So the first part is our customers. So we work with a lot of customers to find problems, to find what they care about and how to do things. We exchange a lot of ideas and we share with them our proof of concept, they share with us. Then we work with academia. I mentioned MIT before, we're working with them for many, many years. Uh, we're working with multiple other universities as well. We're working with different government entities to get access to different uh, solving problems that otherwise you can't solve. You need the legislation part of it. And the last but not least, we're working with venture capitals and startups. Mm. That's where the port of Ashdod comes into the picture. Israel is, is definitely a, a very innovative country. There's a lot of, it's called the startup nation. The technology scene is incredible it's there. It's incredible. I would love for you it's, to touch on that for a second if yeah. you could. <laughs> uh, so there is a lot of different technologies. Uh, there's different uh, thoughts about why Israel became a startup nation and became kind of like a very innovative. I think it's, you know, the surrounding of Israel where the situation where mm -hmm. Israel is part of is always under pressure. Mm -hmm. So people, if you want to be different, you have to, if you want people to be noticed, you have to be different and kind of create. And also, people don't work by the book. Mm -hmm. they, they like to cut corners. It's, it's the nature of people. So it also helps to become an innovation, create an innovation. Uh, so the Port of Ashdod is basically an incubator for startups in, in Israel that are related to supply chain and to the maritime industries. Uh, so when we learn about what they're doing over there, I started to, the discussions and we agree that why don't we start to exchange, you share with us some, some of the knowledge that the startup's doing. We can uh, help them to try the, some of those things for things that are interesting for MERS to solve and we can kind of basically uh, exchange uh, work on that. So, so today we signed up that agreement. It took a few months to work on it. So both of us are very happy with that. So. Do you have a, a favorite startup concept or business in, that's going on in Israel, Israel right now? Uh, there are many startups that we are actually working with Israel right now. There are robotics companies that we work, there are machine learning companies that we work, there's cybersecurity. There's multiple things that currently uh, we're actually probably more than 10 startups that we're working with Israel right now. It's USA, Israel, Europe. That's the amount of uh, startups That's that we have. It's fascinating to, to know that, that those programs are, are going on all across the globe right now. Yeah. And uh, so from you mentioned earlier, I want to switch gears and, uh, again a little bit to uh, the digital twin yes. side of things. Now, for folks who may not know, what is a digital twin? A digital twin is basically a replica of a real environment that you bring it into the digital world and you do something with it. Either you just look at this and you say, oh, okay, this is what's happening right now. Or you can actually take it to the next level and you create some simulation of real case environment based on real case data. A lot of the simulation in the past was done based on theoretical data or certain elements that you take into account. You can also take the information that comes from real live data through machine learning and start to create some simulation. So I'll give you an example. We're talking about a warehousing a digital twin. So what does it mean? Today you have a warehouse management system or WMS where you have certain amount of information there. If you scan something, you get uh, information. If you place it somewhere, you have that information. But you have some productivity information, but you don't really have all the nitty gritty. It's, it stays relatively in a high level. Mm -hmm. If you want to know what exactly happening and what will happen if you change something, the WMS cannot answer that. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so what we want to take is the information in the WMS and then cross 
reference it with uh, potentially video analytics and IoT devices that's giving you certain uh, information on what happened with your automation, with your robotics, with the people around, and start to really learn on the spot what's going on right now in the warehouse, how is the performance of this warehouse, why is it's better or worse than what you planned for, and then start asking yourself what if cases. So if I change this, what will happen? So you can mm. start to change things in the digital twin environment and see how it's going to respond and what, oh, type of, and what type of results you're going to get from that. So instead of going change your warehouse setting and install this and oh, a disaster happened, <laughs> you do all that in, in a digital twin environment and you basically be able to get your results uh, in very high accuracy uh, without change anything yet. So it almost is like a... Because every time I've heard about digital twins, it's been mostly in respect to uh, Web3. You know, the, the, I, yes. there's a lot of things that could be said about Web3, but ultimately, it, you know, the AI, artificial intelligence, VR, is that how you guys are using the digital twin technology? So, so we, we're going to use some of it, but not only, mm -hmm. right? The, the way we think about this will be, first of all, let's, let's understand in a much better way what's really happening today. So, of course, you need AI, machine learning, if you're utilizing video cameras and, and video analytics there, because otherwise it's, it's, you just get pictures, nobody want to look into those. It's not the point. You want to understand what's really happening mm. and from that perspective. But then you need all the machine learning power and the simulation power to basically bring it to, to those what-if cases that we talked about. So that's kind of the direction. So it's industry 4.0, Web3, you know, it's kind of a combination of multiples. It's kind of fascinating to know that you guys are really <clears throat> adopting all of these new technologies for a company that is as old as Maersk. It's yeah. very challenging, I think, for other companies to make this, I guess, adoption or, or want to, I guess, fix something that isn't broke. So for, for when did this start that you guys are really, you know, ahead of the game when it comes yeah. to a lot of these technologies? Because... There are a lot of companies that would refuse to adapt. Yeah, don't get me wrong, it's not easy. <laughs> it's not easy for us as well. You say it's, it's difficult for others. Yeah, it's difficult for everyone. Hmm. It's difficult for us, it's difficult to change. Hmm. Because if something works, you say, why would I? It's not broken, why should I change that, right? But, but the more you talk to customers, the more you listen to them, and you understand they have different problems that you can't solve unless you change. Hmm. You cannot offer that and, and you become a commodity. And commodity, you, the market plays with you up and down and nobody wants to be a commodity. We want to be value added to our customers. We want to be like a partners to them that we can actually help them to manage their supply chain and run that in a better way. Uh, there is a very good example that I'll share soon about uh, how does it work in the end-to-end -end supply chain. But, we started the journey probably five, six years ago that we said, you know what, this is the time to really shift. It takes time, right? The Innovation Center always, we always try to do certain things. It was not exist. So we did it on the side. Okay, take somebody from doing this job and do it to double head here and another person here. But then we realized that it doesn't work this way. You can't do it. You need to dedicate the time. You need mm. to get the resources and money into that. And about a little bit more than a year and a half ago for the innovation center, we decided, okay, this is the approach we want to do. This is the money that we're going to put around it. And we went all the way forward. Uh, but as a company, it's probably about five to six years that we are constantly looking to innovate and change. Uh, so we're, 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 we're mentioned earlier, we're here at Manifest, the Future of Logistics. You spoke at last year's events. I think you have a couple of colleagues that are speaking at this year's event. Have you had time to sort of have, you know, conversations and catch panels and hear any kind of interesting ideas? Do you have, if so, do you so, have a favorite? First of all, I did a lot of spin dating meetings here. <laughs> you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a great place to have that. I think Manifest is a great event. Mm -hmm. Started last year, I was surprised. I came to it and I, I was speaking and I was like, okay, let's see. I saw so many events, but all of them are kind of, more generic, less to the focus point. So mm. I, I was super surprised uh, last year. I was like, okay, we definitely need to be here this year. And I think this year they definitely overdo it even better than what before. So 
great job for Pam and Courtney and, and the rest of the team. It's really incredible and, to see. Yeah, I think it was a thousand people at last year's event. This year, I think it's close it's to four thousand registrations. Unbelievable, unbelievable. This is a, they doing great job and and really there are different events out there, right? Mm -hmm. But they're not really of innovation technology for supply chain. There are maybe innovation, maybe technology, maybe supply chain. Maybe on the side there is the intersect of these things, but <clears throat> this is really a great place for that. Uh, so a lot of spin the dating here, a lot of meetings, with companies that we know and we don't know, and kind of let's, I have to admit, I didn't have a lot of time to uh, be in, in, in the rooms to listen to people. Uh, but I, I have a relatively large team here. We are more than 10 people here that basically many of them are going to different uh, sections. So you have that collaboration. We, we, we're going to have this kind of download from each other and learn uh, at the end of this. So event. you're going to innovate so, after, exactly. after you, you talk to everybody <coughs> and collaborate all exactly. together. 100%. <laughs> all right, Arez, any, any last remarks? Anything you guys are working on that you want the audience to know about? There is, there is something that we're working on that I think it's, it's interesting uh, in terms of innovation. So uh, I, I was talking about all the technology that we're working on and all the robotics, etc. I think one other important piece that we're working on, I mentioned before, is the product innovation. So one of the things that we learned from our customers is that their supply chain is very reliable. Mm -hmm. What does it mean? We actually, before COVID happened, we talked to a few customers and they kept complaining about they can't trust the supply chain, they can't pl plan on that, so help us. And I'm like, what do you mean, supply chain? If the carrier tell you it's from Shanghai to LA, it takes 15 days, it's maybe 14, maybe 16, or that's, that's it. Well, or to New Jersey, it takes 27 days, so it's plus minus a few days, and everything is there. So it's not that, it's the big picture. Mm. So, okay, let's look at that. I took about a million data points from our system, and I kind of like, just let's check what is the lead time or the transit time from the moment the shipment entered the port in Asia, or in Ch that one was China specifically, until it leaves the port here in the US. The finding was shocking to me. We found out that it's 34 days to 74 days, only between the easiest pair of countries in the world. China and the US, there's nothing right. to stop you <laughs> along the way. It's not that it's Indonesia or Thailand or Vietnam that you probably stop somewhere before that or, or 34 True. days to 74 days. I was like, what? What's and why going that on? vast difference between the 30 to 74? So it, it's, it's happened for multiple reasons. One, the whole supply chain is in silos. Hmm. You give the work for this person to do the first step, and then the second one to do that, and there's the third person is doing this. Nobody cares what's happened with the shipment. They care about their only hmm. silo. Right? So if something goes wrong, nobody is trying to fix it. And this is a big problem to start with. Then there is so many handovers of data, of physical goods, of, of knowledge of what's happened. And those handovers take time and, all, and there are delays, basically, that happens all the time. Because of that, yeah, because of so right. many people focusing in on their own responsibility. Then... Ex ac ab absolutely right. Then we basically said, okay, let's look at the end-to-end -end now. Mm -hmm. So we looked at the port to port because I said, that's probably reliable. Then we looked at the end-to-end -end and it's about 30 days to 120 days for cargo to arrive from China to the US, from the factory to the DC, not mm -hmm. even to the final customer, mm -hmm. to the DC. Now, went back to the customers. What do you do with that? They say, so we put in our ERP systems about 90 something percentile of this time. So if it's 120 for them, they'll put 110 or mm. 105. So they based it all on that. And I'm like, what do you mean? But most of the cargo come way before that. They said, okay, so we're happy it's arrived before. Of course, we are not happy because it's money tied into inventories, it's warehouse full of goods that we maybe don't need. How can you help us? They came to us, how can you help us? So just before COVID started, we did a proof of concept with one of the large retailers in the U.S. And we said, OK, let's take your shipments from Vietnam. They had a problem from Vietnam to Texas. So let's isolate only to that. Hmm. What's your transit time? If I'm not mistaken, it was like 
34 days plus minus 15 more or less. I said, we'll bring it in a plus minus three. Let's see if we can do that. I said, how are you going to do that? What are you going to do? I said, we're going to decide how to route the goods for you. Instead of you telling us, prescribe the route, you move it from A to B, from B to C. You give it to me at origin, you tell me when you need it, let us worry. Like you send a courier, mm. you don't tell the courier company, route it via this place or via Very that. true. You just like find, find a way and make sure that it comes on Solve time. my problem for me. Solve my problem. So we manually sat down with the uh, predicting models on Excel that at that time we created. And so, okay, what happened if it goes via this route, that route? And, and we managed 94% of the time. COVID kicked in and it's kind of threw us off almost crazy, but sure. we still managed to bring 94% of the time within that plus minus three days, which was amazing, but it was crazy work behind the scene because it was all done manually with prediction on Excel and, and kind of modeling of things like you cannot really ramp up and do those things in, in a bigger scale. So right now we are basically working to build, a, COVID came a little bit priority shift, but now uh, about the, six that months ago, still exists the problem still exists and, and actually amplified during COVID. Mm -hmm. and, and people like, oh, help us to solve it because it's, it's, it's crazy. We, we don't want all these goods to come before. We don't also want it to come after because otherwise you pay for everything. Right. So we are now working together with MIT to create a, a, a nice predictive models that check all the different routes and, and start to give you a score of what will bring it the right thing. We build an internal system that also gives us the right visibility where the cargo is so you can actually easily start to decide on different. So this is something that we kind of innovate through new product to our customer, ensuring that they can actually uh, get their supply chain in, in, in a much better shape and reduce a lot of the cost they're spending even with us to do something much better uh, to their customers at the end of the day. And so it really sounds like you're, it, it's, it's shining a light on a problem that has always existed, but no one really maybe thought about bringing it to your attention. And yeah. now that it's brought to your attention, there's a lot of maybe, I would imagine, a lot of money that can be saved, a lot of time that can be saved, yes. and when you can combine both of those. And, and a, a lot of formula. good that otherwise can be thrown away or you know, go to sales that nobody cares about. I think it was just a year ago that we had all uh, you know, Halloween merchandise that was still on ships. You know, out in January. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay, maybe for next year. Right. <laughs> what do you do all these 10 months now? <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. Well, they need it for Halloween. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right, Arez, uh, where can folks follow more of your work? Where can they follow Mayor's? All this, the cool stuff you guys are innovating and doing. Where, where can they follow more of your work? Uh, we have a website, actually, about innovation. It's called www.innovation.mers.com. Okay. Forget about it, innovation.merce.com, which we can actually uh, support and show what we're doing about innovation. But of course, on LinkedIn and every other social media, we have a lot of uh, information out there as well. Yeah, your, your, your social is, is, is pretty fun to watch. So I, I love watching the social <laughs> accounts. Um, so yes. I will make sure that I link to all of that in the show notes. But thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Absolutely.